A few years ago, um, I had grown too big for my britches. And I do not mean that I had a pride issue. Um, I had a britches issue. So, and the bad news was that the britches were bigger than ever. So I, well, I had I gotten bigger, my britches had gotten bigger too. And, and I'd, but I got to the point where, where even um, a, a larger set of, uh, of, of uh, pants would not have helped me much. Um, mostly because my wife wouldn't let me have a larger set of pants. But, but I, I'd, gotten, I'd gotten bigger than I, than I, uh, than I had. It, it started in college. After I got out of college, I gained about 15 pounds after my wife and I were married, which is, I guess, normal. It's kind of typical. And then um, we moved here, and uh, after, you know, two or three kids, and because uh, you always put on weight when you're pregnant, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I sat at the computer all day writing bad sermons, and I put on about 35 more pounds. So I, I gotten pretty big, pretty big. I weighed about... Um, I weighed about 14.6 stone, so that's a, you can do the math. I won't, you can go check it out on Google. That's about what I weighed, and uh, and so I knew something would have to be done. And and the thing about it was that the, gaining all that weight had made me anxious. You know, you you start putting on the weight, you start thinking about you know I'm I'm getting too big, and you think about, you think about that, and so you get anxious, and so you eat a little bit because you're anxious, and you know, and you, you check the scale the next morning, and you see that you gained a pound or two, so you get a little more anxious, so you have some ice cream to make yourself feel better, and you check the pound, the scale the next morning, and oh, you've gained a little more weight, and you feel better about that, so you eat a couple of chocolate cakes, and then, then you check the, you know, that anxiety was sort of feeding into that whole tendency that I was having to to put on the pounds, and so and so I, I developed, you know, quite a bit of um, what the French call a vie de poids, which is French for broaden the beam. And um, so I, I knew that I would have to do something, but I, I wasn't sure what, and I was hoping it would involve a large amount of Krispy Kremes. It, it did not. So in case you're wondering, um, I lost my weight uh, the same way everybody else lose weight, loses weight. I ate less and I exercised more. But along the way, I did get some help because um, I didn't just figure that out by myself. I actually had a couple of people who were, who were um, very helpful to me in, in helping me figure out how to, to uh, shed the weight. And those two people were, were of, uh, of all people, uh, Barb Green and my brother, Rick. So, and this is what I learned from, uh, I learned actually portion control from both of them because that was really my problem ultimately was portion control. And they both taught me something very important about portion control. This is what I learned from Barb Green. All my portions were too big. So that's pretty much what Barb Green taught me. So I discovered things like, well, I did not know this. What is a serving size for ice cream? Half a cup. It's a, yeah, see, now I'm with you all the way. But that is not what Barb Green told me. She said, a half a cup. So if you want ice cream, she said, give yourself a half a cup. Now, you don't know, you may not be aware of this, but the, the government recently changed the, the serving size for ice cream to now a cup. But guess what happened to the calories? They doubled. So, so if you're actually going to eat the amount of ice cream that would be a reasonable calories-wise snack, it's still a half a cup. If you're going to be an American and a pig, then you have a full cup. So, but, but it's still a half a cup if, if you want a reasonable amount of calories. So, so I would do things like, instead of having a bowl of ice cream, which is how God intended it, I would have a half a cup. She taught me that, that uh, 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 a serving of meat is about as big as your fist. So if you eat a, a, a chicken breast or a piece of steak, it should be about, as, about, for me, about that big. So, and that's it. Not, you know, like that. So, so that changed. She taught me, she taught me how to, how to um, set up your plate. As you know, your plate should be cut in half and then half of it cut in quarters. And the first half should be full of green things, salad or vegetables, maybe fruit. And then the other half, cut in half again, a quarter of it starch, a quarter of it meat. That's a plate. So how she got by eating with one plate, I don't know, because that was not my system, but that's what she suggested. So, so she taught me about portion control, and I learned things like an egg has 70 calories. I just know that now. So, so I learned how many calories things had and learned how to control myself and, and eat the amount that I should. So she helped me control um, my plate by putting on my plate no more than I should actually eat. The second lesson I learned from my brother, Rick, who also taught me about portion control. And in a good way, don't, don't jump to conclusions. Um, Rick's a big boy, but, but he did teach me an, an important lesson about portion control. And it happened actually when we were in Florida together. He and I and Ed were in Florida for, I think we were there for, for um, the wedding. And we had an afternoon off one day, and my sister Roxanne wasn't stalking around us, screaming at us about the wedding. So we had some time for ourselves, and we were able to go out. And, and we spent, uh, it was, we, he came 
Ed came from Wisconsin, Rick came from Minnesota, and I came from New York, and it was, it was like February or April or something. It was springtime in, in, in Florida, so it was warm out, so we went to an outdoor mall and we're walking around, just enjoying the weather mostly. And we, we stopped at Five Guys and Fries. You ever eat there before? Five Guys? So well, we stopped at Five Guys. I, I'd never eaten there. I can't eat there because my wife is allergic to peanuts. And so, so we don't go there. And, and so we, she's actually allergic to tree nuts, but she's paranoid. But, so we don't go there. So we, we went there. I'd never had it before. So we got in line. We ordered our food. It was great. We got there. And they give this, this hamburger, you know, and, and the fries. They just they have a shovel, actually, in the back. <laughs> so you take that to your sit down thing, and Ed, Rick comes over, and he sits down with me, and, and, and Rick had lost a lot of weight at that point. He was much thinner than he had been before, and he sits down, he takes his knife, he cuts his burger in half, and then he takes his fries, and he puts his hand between them, and he, he parts them in half, and he gets up, and he walks over to the trash can, he slides half the burger into the trash, half the french fries in the trash, comes back and sits down. I don't say anything, you know, because my brother's insane, so I just, <laughs> we're eating, we get finished, we go, we leave, we're walking around some more, and, and uh, we come to Cold Stone Creamery. We're going to have ice cream. You ever have ice cream at Cold Stone, Cold Stone Creamery? It's like you walk at Angels. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful. And they walk in, and, and it's really, the ice cream is just used to deliver toppings. That's all it's there for, because you can pick toppings, and they'll pile it in. They put the little ice cream on the, the little, like it's like a kneading station or something, and they throw top, chop the toppings up and throw them in, and we all order our toppings and ice cream, and, and, and uh, we go outside with a the, with the cup full of ice cream, all just full of toppings. And Rick's standing there, and he takes a spoon, and he flips it over, he cuts it in half, walks over to the trash, screws up half the ice cream, and throws it in. It's like, what are you doing? You're insane. You, you, you paid for that. There are people starving in China. I mean, <laughs> Cold Stone Creamy is the home of the $8 ice cream scoop. I, and he's throwing four bucks in the trash. And he said, that's how I lost my weight. He said, I, I eat out almost all the time. It's about all I ever do. They never give you a reasonable portion. So every time they bring me something, I train myself to cut it in half and throw half away. And by doing that, he said, I cut my calories in half. And I lost all this weight. And so Rick taught me the importance when it comes to controlling your plate of removing things from your plate. Barb taught me about not putting things on your plate. That's one way of controlling your plate. Rick taught me about removing things from your plate. And those are both important lessons. And something that I realized when I was going through that process is this. I control my plate. That was a hard lesson to learn. I control my plate. It's not my wife's fault that I'm fat. She doesn't put food on my plate. She doesn't open my mouth up and stuff things in. It doesn't work that way. I control my plate. I can say to myself when I come to the fellowship meal, well, I got to take some of this and this because I don't want to offend anybody. I want to see if the pastor likes her food. I can tell myself that. That's a lie. I control my plate. I make those decisions. I decide what's going on my plate and what's not going on my plate. I decide what remains my plate when I'm done. Nobody makes me eat every last bite. There's not a clean plate award here. I don't think, is there? hopeful. So, so I control my plate. That's, that's something I need to learn about myself. When it comes to the eating, I control my plate. I'm the person who makes those decisions. Nobody else makes them for me. And uh, since I was a big boy, nobody could make them for me. You touched my food. It's, it, got, it got ugly. So, so I needed to learn that. And something else I realized as I was going through that process is that fat people aren't really jolly. They're actually anxious. They're generally anxious. They're worried about their weight and, and concerned about what they look like. And uh, just like anybody else, you know, they act, I acted happy on the outside, but inside I was very anxious and upset about what I looked like and what my health was like. I, I didn't like going up and down stairs and being out of breath, that kind of stuff. And so I, I realized something had to be done, and I began to work on that process with the help of Rick and with the help of Barb. And, and I got news for you this morning. Every last person here has trouble controlling their plate. Now, I'm not saying you're fat, because some of you are, some of you aren't. I'm not going to point, point any fingers or name any names. So, but... Some of us have trouble controlling our plate when it comes to food. Everybody here has contr trouble controlling their plate when it comes to their time. I would bet that's true. I would bet almost everybody here has too much to do. Everybody here has, feels frazzled sometimes because of their list, right? Do you have one of those lists, this to-do list? You have that list and you look at it and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and it never seems to get any smaller. You scratch one thing off, three things are right at the bottom. That list, that's the list I'm talking about. You all have that list. We all have that list. We all have things we have to do. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's a sense in which you're controlling your plate when it comes to time, too. Or, for most of us, not controlling your plate when it comes to time. And that's a problem. It's always been a problem. It's a problem for Moses. And we're going to find out how Moses dealt with the issue of controlling his plate when it came to time. And we're going to do that by looking at Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 through 27. So if you want to, you can turn there with me right now. It's Exodus 18, verses 13 through 27. 
Exodus 18, 13 through 27, and that is on page, it's on some page in the Bible. So 54 of the Old Testament section. Exodus 18, 13 through 27. It's a long passage. I promised to get you out there by 11.30, so I'll probably read it quickly, but um, we'll go back to it enough that you'll be able to catch it. And if you can read fast, you'll be fine. And if you're Kevin, just listen, Kevin, you'll be fine. We're, we're going we're to get this together. So Exodus 18, 13 through 27. And it came about the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood about Moses from the morning until the evening. Now when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing, his father's name was, was Jethro, by the way. I think it's the most awesome thing, a guy in the Bible named Jethro. I can imagine him, like, before he goes to see Moses, this humongous bowl of cereal with a you know, gallon of milk on it and eats it and then goes in, he's got a rope suspender on and jeans. I'm guessing what it looks like. I could be wrong. So, so as far, where was I? So now Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people. He said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone as judge and all the people stand about you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me and inquire of God. When they have a, I'm, I'm imagining it. I wasn't there. So when they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I judge between a man and his neighbor and make known the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you were doing is not good. You will surely wear out both yourself and these people who are with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I shall give you, excuse me, so I shall, and now I lost my place again. Teach me to swallow in the middle. So I shall give you a counsel and God be with you. You be the people's representatives before God and you bring the disputes to God, then teach them the statutes and the laws and make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they are to do. Furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place these over them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. And let it be that every major dispute that they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure and all these people will also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law probably the first time that ever happened. So, and did all that he had said, and Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and they judged the people at all times. The difficult dispute they would bring to Moses, but every minor dispute they themselves would judge. Then Moses bade his father-in-law farewell, and he went his way into his own land. So, we can see here that Moses had trouble controlling his plate. Clearly, Moses had trouble controlling his plate. And you would understand that, too, if you, if you knew something very important about Moses. Moses was who? Who was he? Don't be afraid. What's that? He's a Hebrew, yes. He's a murderer. Lots of things about him. But I'm thinking, looking for he's the leader of the people of Israel. And how many people is that, by the way? Some people think closer to 2 million. So 600,000 men plus the women, plus the children, probably something like two million people. That is a lot of people. Two million is a lot. I can't deal with, what is there, 80 here or something like that? That's too many for me. Moses, two million people that he's responsible for. We have well, <laughs> we, remember, we try to keep politics out of the sermon. That's the rule. So, so Moses has about two million people he's let out of Egypt. And when they get to the wilderness, he has to set up rules or laws for them to get along with each other because they, they, they've left Egypt. They're no longer in Egypt. They don't have those rules and laws anymore. They have to be gu governed by, by Moses, by God. And so God is telling Moses, here's how they should govern themselves. And Moses' job is then to tell the people, here's how you govern yourselves. Uh, Moses, God tells Moses, this is what they should do for work. And, God, and Moses tells them, this is what you should do for work. He's passing everything through them. He is the person who's responsible for two million people for their overseeing them and making sure they get along together and they have rules by which they can live. And so it's a huge job. And, and you can imagine what happened. So he's by himself, right? He's, he's got nobody else to help him. And, and everybody knows that if they've got a problem, they come to Moses. So every morning when Moses gets up and opens the door to his tent, you know, he gets up, he gets dressed, opens the door to his tent, looks out. He doesn't really do that. There's no doorknobs back then. So, but he goes out, he looks out. Can you imagine the line? There's two million people. They, 
Two people can't get along for 30 seconds. He's got to have a line that stretches to Terre Haute. Right? That's a, that's a joke from Christmas Story. You all look blank. So hey, he's got this big, huge, long line to who knows where, way out there. So how would you feel? Would you want to get up in the morning? He has to be really anxious. Every night he gets up in the morning, he thinks to himself, oh, those people, because they're all out there waiting for him as soon as he walks out of his tent. From morning till night, it tells us, he's out there judging them. How do you think the people feel? Think of this humongous line they're in. What if you're two guys not getting along? You know, I don't know, the sheep poops on your lawn or something, and you, get, you have a disagreement, and you go to see Moses about it, and you get in line. But, you know, you stop, and you have breakfast or something, and it takes a little while to get going, and you get there, and there's already 450 people in front of you. Yeah, you're doing one of these. You're wondering, move the line, move the line, right? It's, you think the line at DMV is bad. Pfft, that's nothing. All these people, and they're probably feeling anxious. They're stressed. They're, because they need to see Moses. They get this, they get this settled. You know, are you going to shoot the sheep? You're not going to shoot the sheep. What's going to happen? So they're in line too, and they're, and they're not happy either. Of all this anxiety building up, Moses is anxious, they're anxious, and Jethro sees this and says, this is not good. And he doesn't say it in the sense that what Moses is doing is bad because Moses was doing God's will. He's doing what he's supposed to do. He's judging the people. He's saying it's not good because it's not good for Moses. Physically, spiritually, mentally, it's not good for Moses. It's not good for the people, physically, spiritually, mentally. So he's, he's, this is what you do. If, if God says it's okay, you notice he doesn't, he doesn't just say, do this, says, you know, check with God. If God says it's all right, this is what I would do. I would divide them up into groups, and then, then they can each judge among themselves. And for something really hard, they'd come to you. So what did Jethro just do right there? He invented bureaucracy. Praise the Lord. Right? He created the DMV right in front of our eyes. So that's what Jethro does. He helps Moses figure out how to handle all these people so that Moses can have less anxiety and so the people can have less anxiety. And Moses has trouble controlling his plate. Jethro helps Moses understand what it takes to control your plate. Because when you fail to control your plate, it produces anxiety. So Moses gets a bunch of flunkies, assigns them to their various jobs. So, and those people all do what they have to do. And Moses only puts on his plate what he has to eat. The only things that he's required to do, which is the hard, are the hard jobs. He throws away the rest, so to speak. He gives the rest away. He doesn't use that. He doesn't keep it on his plate. He takes it off of his plate because he has not room on his plate for all those people. And that's how Moses learned how to control his plate. You know, one of the most anxious things on earth is a to-do list that never gets to done. That is one of the most anxious feelings in the world, to have a to-do list that never gets to done. We all have that list. We all struggle with that list. And that happens because, at least in part, because we don't control our plates. We don't control our plates. We blame somebody else for the plate. We may assume the plate's just our lot in life and there's nothing we can do about it. But the truth is that you have control over your plate. We just choose not to control our plate. And we have to get control of our plates. And I get that that's hard to do. But I want you to think about what I learned about controlling my plate when it came to losing weight. What did I do? What did I do in order to control my portions? Okay, I got advice. Yep, I got advice from others. But what did I do? What are the two things I did to control my portion? That's right. I added good stuff. I picked the good stuff. I chose what was going to go on my plate, and I chucked everything else. I got rid of everything else. So I did two things. I didn't say yes to something until I said no to something else. That's where I made the decision about what was going to be on my plate. And I said no to some of the things that were already on my plate. And that's what I want you to do this week. Before you say yes to something, before because people are going to ask you to do stuff all the time. They're going to say, oh, Dr. Vic, you're so wise and you're so wonderful and if you could just help me out in this way. So, and Dr. Vic says, of course. You wrecked it, Dr. Vic. So, you're supposed to say, wait, because first I want Dr. Vic to say no to something before he says yes to something else. That's one of the keys to controlling your plate is to not take on more than you can handle. So if you, something comes along that really needs to be done that you think is really important, you've got to train yourself to say no to something else to get something off of your plate. Second thing I want you to do is this. I want you to take something off your plate this week that doesn't belong there, that you don't really need. You would be amazed at how many things you are doing that if you stopped doing them, nobody would even notice. They wouldn't even pay any attention. Here, try this experiment. Stop washing your kids' clothes. I guarantee they won't notice. So, 
Now, somebody will notice, but they won't notice. They won't care. So, but really, seriously, there's so many things we do that we take on that if we stop doing them, nobody's going to notice. Find those things in your plate. Throw them off your plate. Cut your plate in half, walk to the garbage, and slide it off. Now, this is very important, too. Do not think to yourself, oh, now next Saturday there's two things going on, so I guess I'm going to go to the other thing and skip worship. That is not what I'm talking about. So, okay, and there's a reason for that, and we'll get to that in a second. So don't start thinking to yourself, well, I'll just cut out Bible study, and I'll cut out church, and I'll stop praying, and I won't read my Bible anymore, and, and I'll be fine. I'll have more time. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about all the other things that we add onto our plate. So this week I want you, I don't want you to say yes until you said no to something. And I want you to think about something you can say no to that's already on your plate, and I want you to chuck it off. Just, just get rid of it. So, so that's your job for this week. Think about that. Don't say yes until you said no, and say no to something that's already there so that you begin to take control of your plate. And if you control your plate, you will control your anxiety. You will control that anxiety you feel from having too much to do. That's all Moses did. That's all Moses did. He controlled his plate. He limited what could go on the plate, he got rid of stuff that didn't belong on his plate. That's how I got a little thinner. I limited what could go on my plate. I got rid of the stuff that doesn't belong on my plate. So this week, I want you to start controlling your plate. Don't say yes until you said no. Say no to something that's already there. If you do those things, you'll begin to take control of your plate and you'll begin to take control of your anxiety. And here's the important thing. If we learn to do that, we will not only lessen our anxiety, you not only feel less anxious because you have less to do, but you will free yourself to work for the kingdom. Moses had really important things to do. They didn't include judging every last little dispute among all those people. Moses had weighty responsibilities. He was leading a people out of Egypt into the promised land. That was a heavy responsibility. He didn't need to add to that judging every last person who belonged to that nation. And until Moses got past that point, he could have spent the rest of his life in that desert judging those people every day, day after day, sun up to sundown. They could have been stuck there forever. That's not what God wanted. God had big plans for Moses. God had a job for Moses to do. But Moses wasn't free to do that job until he learned to control his plate. That's true for us as well. If we don't control our plate, we are not free to do the work that God has for us, for the kingdom. And it's not a good versus bad thing. It's, it's, not a, it's not that sort of thing where, you know, I get rid of the bad things and I bring on the good things. It's really more of a good versus best thing. It's more of a good versus best thing. When we do too many things, it makes it hard, hard for us to be ready when God calls us to the best. When you do too many things, it makes it hard for you to be ready when God calls you to the best. God has great plans for you. God has things for you to do in this valley that are going to amaze people. God wants you to take this valley and turn it upside down, but you can't do that when your plate is too full. You can't do that if you're not open to the ministry and the things that God is calling you to. But I don't want you to throw out worship. I want you to throw out the stuff that's stopping you from coming to worship. I don't want you to throw out Bible study. I want you to stop, throw out the stuff that's stopping you from studying the Bible. I don't want you to throw out prayer. I want you to stop the stuff that's stopping you from praying. And you can do that this morning if you'll take control of your plate. If you will say no to something before you say yes to something else. If you will say no to something you're doing now that's taking up time that could be spent better elsewhere. A lot of stuff you're doing right now, somebody could do better anyway. Let them do it. Control your plate. Lower your anxiety. And be ready when God calls you to what is best. Amen. Mm -hmm.